Hey, uh, thank you. Um, I will invite our speakers and tell you a little bit about the format um, of the rest of the panel. Um, so as it is a storytelling one, uh, we will start with opening stories from all of our participants that you um, see here today. And I'm very grateful to all of our speakers for finding the time uh, to share their experiences and experiences of others that they have worked with um, over the years. Um, after the panelists um, uh, start with their opening stories, we'll um, engage in a discussion. And um, as this is happening, I would encourage you to listen actively to their stories. Uh, pause on your chat. We will then take a quick pause where all of the audience members will be encouraged to share their thoughts and opinions in the chat, uh, what we call a chatterfall. Um, and then our, audience, our panelists will come uh, to your points and discuss those. Um, uh, in the second half of um, the session. Uh, so I think um, those are the housekeeping things and um, I will now stop sharing my screen and um, we will incur invite our first speaker, um, Noura, to um, start with her storytelling. Um, so Noura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ian. Hi, everyone. It's really lovely to be here and uh, part of the Enact Festival, all the work that the InHive team and the wonderful network is doing. So my name is Nuri Yunus. I'm a partner youth engagement based in Accra, Ghana, and I'm with the MasterCard Foundation. MasterCard Foundation is one of the biggest philanthropic organizations in the world, and we're focused on providing dignified and fulfilling work for young people across the continent. My role specifically is to ensure that youth voice is incorporated in all of the aspects of our work, from program design to implementation, governance, decision making, as well as monitoring, evaluation, and learning. I wanted to start, I guess, by, uh, I mean, it's really great to be able to, to participate in this topic. And I was thinking a lot about what it means for, what does systems change mean? And to me, I really, uh, to me, I define youth, uh, sorry, systems change as uh, moving away from the entrenched beliefs, norms, and processes that currently exist towards an alternative path. Systems change can apply to any space physically, whether it's a school system, a workplace, a club, an organization, or it can apply to an idea such as capitalism, environmentalism, and philanthropy. And in my work, I'm really lucky to be able to work with some incredible young people who are trying to create change in their spaces in many different ways. Two specific examples that I think about a lot. Um, one is a young man from Liberia. His name is Emmanuel Guimi. He is a MasterCard Foundation scholarship recipient, and he's a co-founder of an organization called Horn Empowers. They advocate for disability rights and inclusion in his home country of Liberia. They do this through a few ways, and it is not an easy task. They do this through training young people with disabilities in entrepreneurship, but also advocacy in their communities and in society for change in perceptions and mindsets. As a young person with a physical disability, he saw and experienced discrimination within the school system, workplaces, and in society in general. So he's been advocating for change by encouraging young people with disabilities to be involved in the electoral process, to have their voices heard, their concerns heard, and also by running workshops and trainings to empower them to through self-employment, because often they face discrimination in the workplaces and can't get employment, even though they're highly educated and highly qualified. Another young person who often inspires me is named Uva Ali. She is a young woman, also a scholarship uh, recipient and co-founder of an organization called Solace for Somal Somaliland Girls Foundation. They fight against gender female genital cutting in Somalia, which is her home country. Her and her co-founders are trying to change very deeply entrenched cultural norms about FGM through education campaigns, discussions with traditional leaders, and through training of community cutters on the negative health effects on women and girls. They both face a lot of barriers, power imbalances, inequity, discrimination, but they really show and demonstrate that change is still possible. They're trying to change not just norms and practices, but mindsets and perceptions. 
And this is incredibly difficult to do, as many of you know. But what I'm really inspired by is that change can happen, systems change can happen in big and small ways. We sometimes look to examples of change at monumental levels, but we forget that small tweaks and small changes can also lead to an avalanche of change over time. So this is why both of them are so inspiring to me. Um, they might start small, working small at a community level, but every interaction and every changed mindset leads to another ripple of change um, within their circles and beyond. So those are just two stories that I wanted to share that were really inspiring to me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nura, for uh, starting us off and uh, for sharing the two stories uh, of Emmanuel and Uma. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, so we will now move on to our second speaker for his story. Um, James, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much and um, thank you for all the audience that are participating in this time. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'll be sharing a story. Uh, my name is James Uruboyan, just like you've seen on the on board. Uh, grew up in an organization, the African Movement of Working Children and Youth, working in 28 African countries, whose priority is the protection of children, uh, raise the voice of the voiceless, and also ensuring civic participation and also capacity building of uh, children and youth, especially uh, to cause a change in the community. So. Uh, I will be giving my story uh, not uh, very uh, far from the one that Nora have already shared. I will be sharing two stories, one from Togo, a community called Atakwame, <laughs> where two communities are fighting over a piece of land uh, that was given by the, by, the, by the government for them to use for any, any other projects they have in the community. Um, what happened is that we are able to identify some of the children from Two communities that are fighting each uh, against each other uh, for the piece of land. They say the land belongs to all. Our projects will be the one to be on the on the land. Lots of things. And uh, we identify these two children that how do you feel about the quarries? Because you can't move to the other country, uh, the other community. Uh, people from the other community cannot come and there is no any benefit. But once we are able to identify these children from the two uh, communities, we asked them, what can you do to solve this problem? So they were able to identify one issue. Uh, in the two communities, there are no public toilets. <laughs> I'm talking about the community, real community, there are no public toilets. And what happened is that they were the one who identified to build a public toilet on that piece of land that was given by the government. So it's young people who have uh, caused that change. And what happened is that the negotiation starts with the children. They were the one who negotiate between the two communities and the two communities come together to build that uh, public toilet and everyone who use it. And they become uh, uh, people who is in charge of advocacy, advocating for anything concerning child rights, uh, concerning um, even uh, 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 securing a platform where we discuss about child rights in that community today. So that is one of the story uh, from victim to an actor. So uh, we, I can share also the second one is the, uh, a child is today, he's my, he's my colleague. His name is Wifri from, uh, from uh, Cameroon. He was a guy that um, he, he didn't go, he didn't go to school uh, from the from the from the young age, and then um, people tell him that you can't become. He's saying that one day I want to sit in the office working, and uh, someone said, "No, you you don't even go to school. How can you do it?" So this uh, he was identified by a group of children, and then put into uh, what we call a literacy classes where he started learning how to or read and write. And then from there, he, he, he took the courage and said, I'm going to go back to school. I want to go and read. And then from there, he go to the school. He now learned how to read and write. And then he, he continued his study till he become an M and E officer. And for the organization that I work for today, he's the M and E officer. So he said, uh, if this could happen to me, 
it could also have come to so many in the community. So he created some group of, uh, some grassroots groups in Cameroon today who are also doing the same thing, advocating, bringing up those who doesn't have the chance to go to school, to give them uh, uh, the courage to also restart again and, uh, and could become something in, in the future. So these are two stories that I share. Uh, so for me, a, a system change is to change a complex situation to a solution, not for only one person, but for a range of people. And this could be done by anybody, even a young, a young boy. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And a uh, really powerful narrative around from, from victim to actor and having children as the starters of the negotiation. So that's the, thank you so much for, for sharing your stories. Um, we will move now to um, a slightly or very different context, uh, but also looking into uh, youth leadership and change. Um, and I'll pass over to Ruth. The floor is yours now. Thank you, Jan. And hi, everyone. Great to be here. And thanks for joining us. Um, so, yeah, my name is Ruth and I'm uh, in Geneva. And I wanted to just share kind of my personal story around, I guess, systems leadership. Um, which is that, yeah, I've always been like very excited and inspired by the idea of people changing systems through people power, you know, like coming together and actually building something else and been very excited about sort of social movements and alternative models of organizing and collaborating. Um, and so when I was, I guess, growing up, I knew like I definitely wanted to sort of make a difference in the world, you know, like do something meaningful, impactful, etc. cetera. Uh, so I studied uh, geography. Um, which was all about kind of big challenges of our time around climate change and inequalities and these kinds of things. Um, and I think looking back on it, it was also about broken systems, basically. So many systems that we have in the world today, the economic system, you know, organizational systems, a lot of them are very broken and very kind of, um, yeah, unequal and, and, and we need new solutions. Um, and there was a quote that I always remember about um, our privileges are, are on the same map as other people suffering. So everything is interconnected. You can't look at like famine happening now without looking at like where there's surplus in the food system, for example, and kind of the systems perspective I found really um, exciting. And then I came into the UN. So I joined United Nations as an intern um, about 10 years ago now. Um, and um, kind of, I guess, yeah, sort of, after being there for a while, I managed to kind of stay in in different roles um, and started noticing that there's so many discrepancies between what we advocate for um, and what we're doing inside the organization in terms of, you know, saying we need to like collaborate to solve these big challenges, but then the way the organization set up is in silos and there's all of these different, um, you know, silos and things like this um, and sort of I guess started asking the question, well, surely there's another way. There's all these big reform processes that are going on, but they feel kind of out there, like something you can't have an impact on. Um, so a few of us started talking about this and saying like, you know, what could we do? Um, you know, we're junior people inside this big system that feels very difficult to change and very entrenched. But at the same time, you know, it does need to change. So like, what are we going to do about it? And um, we just invited people to a workshop to say, do you care about the UN and its values? Do you think it's needed for the world we live in? Um, do you have ideas? Um, and we got people together around that and sort of started building, I guess, this more of a movement for change inside the system. Um, and that was about six years ago. Um, and we grew, grew to have around 2,400 members across the world. Um, all working in different parts of the UN, um, which is kind of unusual because everyone's normally in their silos. So coming together itself is already <laughs> kind of exciting. Um, and we like, you know, wrote to the Secretary General and said, hey, we want to work with you. We got invited to a lot of different committees kind of shaping, um, I guess, the debate within the system around things like future of work, innovation, sustainability, leading by our values. So that's like the, the vision of the network, which is called Young UN Agents for Change. Um, and yeah, I'm nearly out of time. 45 seconds left. I've got my time running. So I was just going to say that um, I guess kind of through this experience, I'm happy to go more into it. But um, I think the kind of lesson has been like it's easy to see a system as out there as something that you can't have any impact on because it's so big and it's so scary. Um, but I would just encourage everyone to think like what systems am I part of? Like if you have a bank account, you're part of the financial system in some way. If you're part, if you're employed by an organization, you're part of that organizational system, which means that you also have the power to start trying to change things as well and building networks, 
finding other people there'll be other people who feel the same way as you um and having those conversations and just starting is already um yeah a huge start so yeah looking forward to the discussion that's a timer <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ruth, for, for keeping to time, but also for, for uh, your personal story and kind of uh, being in the system. And I think one of the themes that seems to be starting to, to come through from, from, from Nura and James and yourself is this kind of question around um, feeling able to change things, right? And kind of not being overwhelmed by the size of the challenge and kind of thinking and recognizing the different levels and where, where change starts. So, I'm sure that's going to uh, continue to be a, a theme in, in uh, the remaining presentation. So I'll now um, invite uh, Sylvia to um, the floor. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. My name is Sylvia, Sylvia Kananu. Um, I work uh, in Youth Excel, a USAID funded program. I'm based in Kenya and really happy to be here. Um, so before I talk a little bit about the work, um, I think what Ruth shared was just reminding me of my earlier journey when I started, um, you know, in, in this development space. So I remember I was in a, I would say a fairly, you know, comfortable, cushy FMCG job. But while I was there, I did feel like, is this all? Like, I did want to create impact. And so one of the areas I, I was and still I'm very passionate about is the issue of entrepreneurship. So I know this is true for my country, Kenya, but it's also true for a lot of youth out there in, in various contexts and countries. And so I felt like, what can we do to be able to have uh, more people venture into entrepreneurship, uh, succeed in it, see this as a viable op uh, op opportunity, because to be honest, um, there are not enough jobs. And this is funny, it was true 10 years ago, as it is true now. In fact, it's exacerbating, it's becoming worse. Um, and so what I realized now in hindsight that I lacked then was systems. I was trying to do this on my own. I was young and, uh, well, much younger, <laughs> maybe that's the word to use. And so I, I didn't really have the luxury of or the under or like the networks that I think a lot of us here are trying to build for young people. And so that's, that's what made me uh, probably not achieve as much success as I would have, as I see a lot of people have an opportunity today. Mm -hmm. And so that brings me actually now to what we are doing at Youth Excel. So at Youth Excel, we see ourselves as probably facilitating youth leadership and creating an enabling environment for systems change. And I'll just give a practical example of what that looks like. So um, we do have a, a very um, interesting um, activity that we call ICONS, which is issue-based collaborative network. And so to talk about that, I just want to share with you some of the stories of the young people that I, I, I personally know um, and enjoy working with. And so like we have a group of about, I would say, 20 young people and doing different things. So, for example, one of them is Doreen. She's never been to university, but she's passionate about agriculture. She sees its potential and she wants more young people to join agriculture to see this as a viable opportunity as opposed to having an income, uh, as opposed to having employment. And then we also have uh, people like Michael. So Michael runs an informal, not registered self-help group for persons with disabilities. And through his small organization, I would say he's trying to be able to fight for change for uh, persons with disabilities to access opportunities. Um, and then we have young, you know, other other young uh, people who are doing really incredible things. But the problem is they don't know they don't have the right networks to be able to to really, I would say, explode or really. Um, enhance the work that they're doing. And so that's what really the icon is about. When I talk about the icon, so this stands for issue-based collaborative network. And to put it simply, this is a, um, a, a place-based, so it's must a certain locality issue-based um, collective of people. And so these people includes both youth and decision makers, decision makers across yeah. higher education systems, decision makers across um, uh, public sector and private sector, and we bring to get them together to um, solve, uh, an, uh, to, to tackle an issue that is of concern in the area. So for example, we do have one such in Kisumu, Kenya, and unsurprisingly, the issue that we are solving is uh, to do with youth work readiness. Yeah, How can we get more youth ready for the workplace, whether that is in terms of employment and entrepreneurship? And so what we see, and going back to what I said, we want to facilitate intentional um, collaboration so that we can see people tap into networks, be able to influence. And we are using research as one of the ways of influencing because we are um, uh, supporting young people to use evidence to be able to see what works in their programming and share 
share this with decision makers. Yeah. And so I could I could go on and on about this, but I, I just want to share with you what that has been, what that journey has been like. So by bringing together these different stakeholders for a couple of months, what we have seen is incredible. First and foremost, we have been able to uh, help young people see themselves as change makers. I, I, I don't want to go into all the stories, but we can mm -hmm. see them saying, oh, I, I, I you know, um, I, I didn't know I could do this. I didn't know I could be an expert in this. I did, I've realized when I'm using research to talk to decision makers, I'm seeing them listening to me. And we've seen that uh, by bringing them together, having them share, uh, using, you know, share their findings with, with other stakeholders, we've seen great results. We've seen, uh, you know, some of them first and foremost are forming networks with each other. So whereas they, they were just individual organizations or people trying to do things on their own, now they have a network, this network of 20 uh, youth or about 20 youth who are also able to tap into each other's networks. We've seen them be invited into um, technical working groups in, in, in the, at the county local government level. And so that means that they have now, a, a, literally they have a seat at the table. And so um, just to, to, to round up what I'm saying is, so what do I see our role as, or what is one of the various roles that we, you know, we choose to play um, in enabling youth leadership? It's just going back to what I said, supporting young people to see their potential and be the leaders that they can be. And secondly, creating that enabling environment and facilitation to make sure that young people are able to um, have the networks they need to succeed. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sylvia. And I, and I think it's a, it's a really important point that we will, and I think Seema, who is our next speaker, will pick up on this as well and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Is this kind of the, the different roles we all play in supporting system change and like youth-led systems change. And so there's different roles that the different people speak. So thank you so much for starting off that conversation. and. Um, uh, our final speaker uh, to make her opening presentation is Seema. So Seema, the floor is yours now. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, I'm Seema Patel. I'm the CEO of the Global Knowledge Initiative. We are a nonprofit that works uh, globally to catalyze systems innovation initiatives for large scale change. And our programs are really designed to build kind of collective insights and vision and collective momentum uh, to help people work better together to innovate within systems and to transform fundamentally the way they function to make a more, more resilient, more equitable, more empowering. I have had a 20 year journey in the development sector and the social impact sector, uh, very much building a range of different types of initiatives and programs fostering entrepreneurship um, with young people and, and others, fostering entrepreneurship, and really trying to build these uh, collaborative multi-stakeholder type initiatives. And at the heart of all of these experiences in my, in my career and pathway are stories like the ones I think we've heard today, stories of young people and the incredible energy and creativity and change that they can bring to these really complex challenges we face in the world. And yet, um, over and over again, we see large scale initiatives for systems change, excluding them. They're not at the table. They don't have the power in the foremost power structures to really um, be integrated into those efforts. And so as an organization and as a practitioner for so long, I really think about what are the roles? What are the archetypes? What are the skill sets? What are the mindsets? that are needed in leadership to create systems change? And where do the youth fit into that kind of structure? And we've come across a couple of frameworks that I think are really helpful when we think about the roles that people play in systems change. One is focused on four archetypes, the entrepreneurs that create change, that create new solutions, the entrepreneurs that live within formal power structures or organizations and institutions, and make change happen from the inside, like we heard from the story from Ruth. Um, the forcing of change, the activists, the people that stand up and build movements and say the system as it is, is not tenable. It cannot survive this way and build advocacy and you know, risk and shame for those that allow that system to be in place. And the co-creators, the lovers, the ones who say, we need to bring people together. We need to cut across our silos. We need to think about collective interest and not self-interest. And all of these kind of roles and approaches to change, I think are so beautifully um, articulated in the stories of what we see in young leadership. 
that A, they can play any of those roles. We've seen incredible young entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial movements, activism, as we know, is very much in history been, uh, you know, young people have been at the front edges of activism and advocacy that stand up and say the system can't work the way it is. And so why do we continue to hold back? Why do large scale development organizations and governments that are trying to create change leave them out of the picture? And I argue that as we like reflect on this, like what is it gonna change to shift the role of young people in systems change? I think it's two fronts. You know, one is fostering that skill set, that mindset, that empowerment within young people themselves. And I think um, the programs and stories and initiatives that have been shared very much speak to that. We did some research at GKI on what are those skill sets, what are those mindsets that really embody systems leadership that is um, supportive at, at, of acting and you know creating in a complex world, and you know, that's distinct from traditional leadership and what we're often teaching in our education and systems and in our institutions or in our um, employment development programs within companies. And there, there are things like, you know, the kind of skill sets of seeing opportunity in pain, the ability to explore the interconnection between self and the whole, which we heard a little bit about, you know, seeing yourself as part of a system emoting and encouraging empathy, which is so often forgotten in how we sort of build the structures around that, all the way to things like facilitation skills, uh, the ability to foster collaborative learning and design, building um, relationships and nurturing networks. And I think most importantly, inspiring action and innovation and uh, the ability to prepare for change because our systems are constantly going to change. They're going to be bombarded by new challenges and new shocks as we've seen in COVID, as we see with climate change. And so the adaptability and flexibility to see that change and to respond to it. So these skills are inherent in some people, but they're all developable. You can nurture them. We can foster incredible structures and ecosystems and environments to help build these kind of soft, but they're not soft. We all know they're very hard skills and they take practice and patience and resilience. And so building that ecosystem and environment that we sometimes see around things like entrepreneurship for systems leadership is I think a big challenge to the community um, going forward. The other element of this that, I, that I've been reflecting on is not just building the systems leadership skills of young people, but also disrupting the existing power dynamics. So building up their power, but also disrupting the existing power dynamics of organizations and institutions and higher ups to value the voice of people, for them to sort of shift their mental model, um, seeing young people as agents of change, as catalysts and changing their practices to become more exclusive, more collaborative and more equitable in the way they engage the youth in their conversations and decisions. And so, uh, that's that's the sort of dual part uh, call to action that I put out there um, as we all you know look at the kind of power and roles that we might play in this room within some of these formal and institutions that uh, are trying to make change happen. Thank you so much, uh, Sima, for those uh, provocations and calls for action and uh, reflections. Uh, I definitely found them. Uh, uh, very stimulating and uh, helpful to to think to frame uh, you know the stories that we have heard. Um, conscious of the time, um, I was wondering actually. So if we would now have the space for our panelists to speak with one another. But I actually wonder um, whether um, what we could do um, instead is actually take a quick pause and allow the audience uh, to maybe share with us their reflections. Um, on what you have heard from the, the, from the panelists and the speakers. So um, what we will do now is actually then if, if uh, my uh, uh, fellow panelists will um, humor me this slight change, but we would then pause and allow the audience to, to put into the chat um, any, anything that um, was sparked in you uh, from the stories that you heard. Um, we will kind of uh, pause and uh, have the time to read what you um, say in the chat as well. Um, and in the meantime, 
um, uh, our panelists can think about their responses to what they heard from, from one another and what will come from you. So um, the chat is now open. And so please, everyone, do put in your reflections, your questions to the, to the panelists, um, uh, and we'll uh, pick it up in the next three or four minutes. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for your questions. And please do uh, keep them coming in um, and putting them in the chat. Um, and rather than necessarily picking any one in particular, um, I would maybe just uh, offer it to the speakers to pick any question or any point that your fellow speakers have raised that you would like to uh, reflect on. So there's no particular order, but if um, anyone would like to start off with their reflections, um, please feel free to unmute and um, to share your thoughts. I'm happy to go first. I was just kind of reflecting on the question that I think Dennis put in the chat. Um, about how best young people can self-organize um, beyond tokenism. And this is definitely something that I feel very strongly about too. And I'm sure many of us do. Um, one piece of advice I, was, I would give is be too good to ignore. Um, if people don't give you a seat at the table, then create your own table because we can't just wait around kind of just asking for permission. Um, and asking for the right to be heard. We have to be heard. We have to share our voice uh, regardless of whether or not people want to listen to it. And that, I mean, it can happen in different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean standing in the room and shouting, but it does mean organizing, um, finding strategic allies who will help you to empower your voice. Um, and then again, the power of networks. If you're working with a group of people who are like-minded, values aligned, um, and are also equally inspired, it makes 
the work that much easier so that you don't necessarily feel like you're taking on this momentous task on your own. Um, and I know that can sometimes be difficult for many of us. Culturally, I grew up in a culture where I'm supposed to ask permission, sit nicely, um, and it's sometimes really difficult for us to break out of that. Uh, but once you, I think it was, um, I think it was Ruth who said getting started is the hardest part. I would completely agree. I think getting started is the hardest. That first step is the hardest part, but finding a network of people to, to help you in that journey will make it a lot easier. So I would say to Dennis, build your own table. Don't wait for an invitation. I'd love to follow up on that a little bit of, um, uh, there's some really great content that's been put out around movement building across, you know, so many different practitioners. And one in particular that sparked my interest is uh, 198 Methods for Nonviolent Movements. It's by Gene Sharp, and I can post it on the chat. But there are tactics, really concrete, practical tactics about power building and power emoting and how do you use that. And so this book, I think in particular, has looked at so many kind of people movements, social, social movements around the world and found those tactics that really can disrupt, create risk for existing structures and power and you know, really start to build the advocacy around the change that wants to be created. So I think it's right, it's not about waiting to be invited to something, it's about looking at the system in, in a holistic way and seeing where do we have power, not just I, but where do we have power and how can we use that power to really shift the mindsets and to shift the deep structures that are in place. And I think these tactics will be interesting for people to, to consider that are working on that. Maybe I'd like to start from the pickup from where she, she just ended. Uh, in the organization where I grew, we believe that you don't give power to people, we take power. And to take power, you don't need to speak, you need to, to act, it's an action. And for us, um, we have a slogan in the organization, we say that the rights are not just to be proclaimed, but they have to be built. You set example. The first thing you have to make sure you have, you have a common goal as a group. You identify people who are really victims. That is why I was talking about from victim to actor. If you are not consigned by the issue that has been discussed, there will be a different story, the way you react, the way you communicate around it. So for you to do it, you identify your colleagues who are in the same um, uh, uh, situation like you. We can even call it a collective leadership that, okay, you have the same situation, I have the situation. So how can we change this situation? Who else, apart from those who are in power today, can help us to give a prototype of solution? Because when you want to talk, you don't want to talk just because you need them to do something, but you go with evident base. So for you to take the power, you need to prove an evidence, you go with an evidence. And when you start doing it, you are not doing it uh, maybe to, to, to criticize, you are not doing it uh, to say what the, the leaders are doing is not good, but you are doing it to show the way. So the leadership in system change starts from concrete actions and the actions speak more than the voice that you could have. So as long as you started doing that, the invitations will calm themselves. You are not going to, you are not going to seek for them. So that is how we start in the organization where I work. Those are some of the examples that I, I could give for that uh, particular question that, that was um, asked. Thanks, James. Um, I think I can go next. So there's a question here that is form, that forms part of what I've been thinking about um, of late. And so that was from Divya. So basically Divya was asking, what are the good practices to bring um, in for, for youth collectives and how do you make those sustainable? And so um, I think some of the things that uh, I would say we have learned along the way, um, First and foremost, for, for youth collectives to succeed, you must all you must be joined by a very common agenda. So it's not enough that we're young people um, and we care about one, you know, one very broad topic. Just try and understand. So what is the glue that holds us together? So um, in terms of like 
making sure the um, that you're all aligned on this is the good this is the one thing we want to find and um if you have that extremely common factor that common issue or the the thing that that brings you all together i think that really helps to form um the glue that that helps these organizations to be sustaining and i really do want to emphasize this it's we as 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 i guess it's in human nature to want to we tend to uh, lean towards people who are most like ourselves um but what i've seen is that when the group is is very diverse that's when we have a lot of things to learn from one another it's not just organizations that have been 10 years in existence versus one that's one year in existence so it's not like one way learning it's two way learning there's two way challenges um so i think that's um <coughs> Another, I, I would say, uh, for, from my experience, another success factor, because again, the more diverse you are, the more diverse networks each of you have, and the more you can uh, tap into each other. So I think uh, I would say those are some of the building blocks for, um, you, you know, having a cohesive, like, collective of young people. And um, as, as I was thinking about this, uh, thinking about how can this succeed, and I remember something, uh, we, we had a, an event recently, and so we, we do have a partner um, here in Kenya, and so the, the Founder is pretty young, still a you know, still a youth, and um, he's he, he gave this was a question that came up in that event, and so he said, you know, be visible and join networks. So it's not about just like okay, this is the thing I'm doing. Try, um, I think James, you put it like we just take power. <laughs> I think I want to rephrase that and say, you know, take initiative. Um, you know, it, there's always organization like you know, if if for example, if you're working in the area of, um reproductive health, these, these groups that are doing that, find what these groups are, take that initiative to find these groups yourself just make sure you're part of the conversation be known for something so you know like kind of have that mark that i uh you know whenever people think of uh james they think of this so th so that that way you start propelling yourself and i think i also want to share some good news if you've not noticed this but like i feel like in the development space people are starting to see the value of working with local actors more and more and so and um if i can speak about usaid is also trying to work with more organizations it's a priority of this administration to work with newer partners so this is really a moment to be able to get that kind of if i if i can talk about support there are resources like work with usaid.org where you can get to know various ways how do you work with usaid what are ways you can start um even if you've never worked with them so like being proactive to look for these opportunities and then you know joining yourself to groups and networks um i, I would say i would probably help you in terms of making this sustainable as well as successful thank you thank you so much oh go ahead sima please yeah i just want to add a few more to that that sylvia had mentioned um uh, gki worked on designing a network for learning for people that are uh, passionate about youth development or that are youth themselves and there's Two networks I just resources might be interesting for this community. One is youthlead.org, and this is a young people's network to share lessons and learning about building networks and coalitions and creating power. So it may be of use to folks. And then the other is um, youthlearning.org, and that's more for people that are um, developing programs or initiatives for uh, empowering and supporting youth. And so both of these have those kind of learning communities that I think are, would be uh, valuable for folks to consider joining. Thanks, Seema. And, and I was actually wondering, um, Ruth, how was it for you in terms of, I, I guess, reflecting to what you heard from the other panels in terms of like having the, I guess, the courage and getting to the space of like, now I am ready and I recognize that I can be the change maker and, the, and kind of stepping forward and like finding those networks and the allies. Um, how was it for you when you were launching with your colleagues uh, at the UN? Um, yeah, thanks, Jan. And thanks everyone for all these great thoughts. I've been scribbling down, <laughs> scribbling ideas. Um, how was it? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it was, it was kind of, yeah, surprisingly, I, I, surprisingly took off, I guess would be my, my feeling, you know, like you kind of think, is it just me who feels like this? Like, do I feel kind of, you know, I'm the one who's in the system. I don't have the impact I wanted to have, like weighed down these kinds of things. You start talking to other people and you're like, there's other people who feel this way, but there's, we're all talking about the problems. We're not talking about like what to do about it, how to build a space to actually shape things. And then by the time you actually like, you know, we just like wrote to as many people as we could and just said, hey, do you do you resonate with this? Do you want to do something about it? And like the response was 
like really positive, like so many people coming forward. And then so many people also, I think just a lesson has been like to start with, and there was someone in the chat asking about how to start collectives. And I would say kind of start with like a, a vision or a, or a kind of fall in love with the problem rather than um, kind of a very concrete plan. Like nobody wants to get involved in like, this is exactly what we're gonna do and this is your role and this is your role. They wanna get involved because they think something needs to change and they also feel that and they have, and then they bring their whole creativity because they're like, oh, hey, why don't we do this like tactic or you know, write a letter or like make a video or like you know, organize a workshop or, you know, and people just start showing up with all these kinds of things. Um, so I think like, yeah, I guess sort of surprised at how easily it kind of took off. Um, and also how it was received at the top like when we wrote to the secretary general we got like a very positive reply and then also the kind of the power of networks within the system as well in terms of like there was the youth envoy for example who's the youth envoy to the secretary general who participated in the meeting with us and then she introduced us to like some of these decision making spaces within the system and young Yuan started getting invited to those spaces um, and kind of you know it kind of a knock-on effect and I, I think I would just pick up on a couple of things that others said about like um, acting instead of speaking. Um, I think that's so valuable because um, that's definitely what we found as well. I think like, you know, just sharing our views and saying this needs to change is one thing, but both in terms of like the motivation for your community, like if you're actually taking small steps towards that change as well, you're not just advocating and saying, oh, hey, we need to change, we need to change, but you're trying to build it, then it's much more motivating. Um, and also it, I think then, people start looking at what you're doing and saying, hang on a minute, these lot, they're just like a load of people who are doing this in their free time and how come they're making all this stuff? And it's like, yeah, because we've changed the space in which we're coming together. And so that means people can bring their creativity and all that kind of thing. So um, I, would just, I would just say like, Seema, when you were speaking about these two things that need to change, like the mindsets and skills, I totally agree with, and they're spot on from like my experience at least in terms of what they are. And then there's a disruption. But I think the third one, which we've kind of spoken about just now is like building the new, like you have to also build the new one at the same time and show that it's better than the old one <laughs> so that people start like investing in that system and saying, hang on a minute, what are they doing? How are they organizing themselves? And how is that being effective and producing different results? Um, so yeah, those would be a few, a few thoughts that sparked for me and <laughs> hopefully responding to your question as well, Jan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much, Ruth. And, and I'm just conscious of the time and I would maybe just as a, as a way of starting to, to wrap up the, the stories, I wonder whether any one of you would be um, able to maybe um, offer an example or kind of a practical, uh, I, and there are quite a few suggestions already floating around, but um, to, to think about kind of how not to get disheartened in the process um, I think, you know, we, we, you know, one of the reasons why we are having storytelling uh, panels here during the festival is to recognize that it is not an easy um, systems change is not an easy process. And I think, you know, the power of the network is also that kind of encouragement and the kind of like, you, you, you know, uh, even though there are setbacks, there is a pushback, you will kind of persevere and you can get through. So, you know, as a, as a way of kind of closing, if there is anyone who is able to maybe offer uh, one or two other kind of from your experience um, ways of keeping um, encouraged and motivated to keep up the fight in in, in face of uh, potential. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll start and someone else could, could add something. Uh, generally, even with the questions that we receive from uh, the audience, if you look at it, um, uh, to make a change doesn't start from uh, being in a position and this has to be very clear in the mind. And to change a situation is not just being together and then raise your voice. It doesn't work. And these are some of the principles that have to be clear for us. And the third thing that I want to say, to change a situation, you have to know exactly what you want to change. And if you don't know it, there'll be a confusion. So starting from uh, the first, uh, points where I raised, you need to be able to know that as a group, we need to come together. We need to come together, identify a common problem that we say, okay, we want to change this. We know specifically what we want to change. Now to change it, how can we make sure that this change, even the, the change starts, we can ignite the change without even raising our voice. 
like I said, that you, they will not give you power. You take the power, but for you to take the power, you have to start from somewhere. So this has to be very grounded. It's not because we want to make noise. Sometimes we say that actions speak louder than voice. So you start with the action, then the voice will follow later. So we create a change, maybe creating a prototype of what we are doing that could help people to see that, ah, okay, this is what they are saying. We make it known by actions, then people can then join you. Even those who, who are not um, in your group could also join you. And the third thing that you have to make sure that you did is that you recognize the position and the power of each person among the group that you have. It's not, it's not a competition. We are going for the same thing. And if we are going for the same thing, I have a contribution, he has a contribution. So if you have a group that there are some kind of, okay, um, some fights, uh, I have to be there, not you. I have, it means we are not for the same thing. We are not in for the same thing. So there are so many things to say. I just want to ship in those three things that help you to keep on the fight. One, you have a common goal. Two, you create an actions. Number four, you have an objective, a common objective that all of you, you know that at the end, this is what we want to change. So this is just something few I want to share. Thank you. Thanks, James. And, and you know, I think the, the kind of uh, what you spoke about in making a, in different words, but speaking about making this relationships inclusive, that everyone recognizes their own power and kind of being listened to so that you can speak. I think that was very, very powerful. And I think that does keep people motivated in the fight, they kind of being respected and valued uh, and recognized for what they bring to the table. So thank you so much. James for offering that and there's so much more I'm sure our panelists would love to share but uh, because we are um, at the end of our time together what I will probably do um, is actually just encourage you to keep up that conversation um, and um, the festival is really just a start to further conversations and so um, there is a lot more that we can do together keep learning from one another um, uh, it could be, as, as you saw in the chat, through our Nexus community, it could be through other platforms, and I will definitely uh, continue collaborating with our panelists today uh, to keep sharing their experiences and um, experiences of young leaders that they have supported over the years. So um, I hope that you will um, be able to participate in future um, events from the festival. Um, and as we are signing off, please do leave in the chat any <clears throat> takeaways that you're taking from this conversation anything that resonated again with you and you can um, uh, maybe implement in your own work in the programs that you run to support young people or as a young person that you feel you want to try uh, in order to create those allies and networks around you so with that thank you so much to to our speakers for your wonderful contributions for taking the time um, and um, uh, hopefully this is just the start for further conversations though so. Thank you, everyone. Please leave your comments in the chat and we'll see you in the next um, festival event. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, Jan. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Nora. We'll have to wrap up because the next event is starting in one minute. So they Perfect. need to we'll leave. <laughs> follow up with an email. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jimba, and thank you all in the audience. Um, uh, really appreciate it. Good luck with the rest of the festival. Thank you.